Hello and welcome to Half the Sky, how to get gender equality back on track. I'm Malika Kapoor, Deputy Global Editor of Bloomberg Live, and I'm so pleased you could join us today for a really important discussion. Today, we are looking at the toll the pandemic has taken on people around the world. As we know, it has impacted women differently and disproportionately. There are real concerns COVID-19 could profoundly impact an entire generation of women unless we act now. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsor, Google Cloud, and to welcome our community from across Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia. And also say hello to our audience tuning in on social media and via the Bloomberg Terminal. Just a few quick housekeeping notes before we get started. Please refresh your browser if you're having any issues with audio or video quality, and you might. I wish we were together in a room, but since this is a virtual event, these are things we just have to deal with. Uh, you can restore windows using the buttons at the bottom of your screen. And please engage with us on social media. We are active there. You can join the conversation, and we would encourage you to do so. You can follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook using the handle at Bloomberg Live or at Business. And you can use the hashtag. It's hashtag Bloomberg Equality. So let's start with our first speaker, and it is my pleasure to introduce her. Joining us this morning is Mrs. Cherie Blair. She's a barrister, lecturer, writer, and founder of the Cherie Blair Foundation for Women. Mrs. Blair, thank you so much for joining us. It's absolutely my pleasure for such an important conversation. Great. I wanted to begin by asking you, do you think this could impact an entire generation of women or perhaps even more? How worried are you? Well, I think we are right to be worried because it's already having an adverse impact on women as we speak. Just in September, the UN report uh, estimated that due to COVID, if measures are not taken, 47 million more women will be pushed into poverty over the next year. And we know, don't we, that the consequences for the women and for their children of living in poverty uh, definitely have. Uh, a generational and lifetime impact. Um, you know, but this is also, I think, we have to be careful not to be too negative because I, I believe that women are very strong and very resilient and women have experienced a lot of progress over the last half century or more. And I don't think that they are going to give up that progress so easily. Um, that it's obviously easier to say that when you have financial resources, as we do um, in the developed world, um, you know, but if you're pushed into poverty, then resources are very, very limited and therefore much harder to break out of that poverty. So I believe we can do something about it, but I don't think we can be complacent. And by the way, it's not been the case that everything's been so marvelous for women, even before the pandemic. For example, the world. Mm -hmm. uh, economic Forum Global Gender Gap Report showed that in economic uh, activity and participation in the economy, last year, women actually dropped back and the uh, chances of having equality with men uh, actually increased by another 55 years. So in 2019, the report said it would take 212 years for women to reach uh, global economic parity with men. And last year, just the report published in the end of last year, it said it was going to be 257 years. So things were not great beforehand, but there's no doubt at all that the pandemic has had a big impact in that. Absolutely. And let's look at where it's had the maximum impact. You know, in most economic recessions, more men lose their jobs than women. But this time that's been flipped around. And of course, it's because women are sort of overrepresented overrepresented in certain industries like hospitality and retail. What are some of the learnings from this, from what we've seen? Like what should have, could have been done differently so that we didn't end up in a situation like this? Well, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, in some ways, the health implications that seem to have impacted on men worse, but the economic implications for women are great. And as you say, yeah. that's partly because women are in uh, heavily impacted sectors like retail. Um, but it's also, of course, because of that double burden that women have 
in relation to caring responsibilities as well. And we know, for example, women often work part-time uh, and that part-time workers have been particularly vulnerable in, in, in this case, in, in this, in this uh, pandemic. Um, and so what can we do to ensure that this uh, doesn't continue? Well, obviously, <laughs> solving the, uh, the vaccinations and, and getting rid of the pandemic would, would be a start. But in relation to making sure that we support women's businesses, I think we have to be very aware uh, of the different um, impacts and the different priorities for women business owners. Women business owners tend to be in smaller businesses. Now, that's partly uh, uh, because, well, it's mainly actually because they don't have the resources. And whether you look at a, a small woman, home-based business making cakes, or a woman with an international business, what we know is that women don't get the investment that men uh, seem to attract. That's for cultural reasons. It's for conservatism within the financial sector itself. I mean, there's a lot more we could do about ensuring, as we come out of the pandemic, we target resources into women-led businesses at all levels, whether from the small micro businesses right up to the top, to ensure women get a fair share of the uh, expansion that we hope to see in the economy eventually. And the reality is, if we just leave that to chance, it won't happen because we've left it to chance for years and years and years. And what do we see? It's not happening. It's not happening. Um, I think there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, it's partly a question of, uh, you know, running a business. I can be really good at baking cakes. <laughs> I can be very good at health and beauty. I can be a really good techie woman, but I could be a doctor. But I don't necessarily have the business skills that are required. And I think we can do a lot more to support women by providing them with access to business skills. Because many women are finding that in today's marketplace, if, if their employers are not adapting to the reality of their lives, then they vote with their feet. And they find that one way that they can combine their work and their family responsibilities is actually setting up their own businesses. But if you jump into that without understanding the mechanics of what's required to run your own business, you can find that, in fact, uh, instead of flourishing, instead of swimming, you can actually sink. So I think resources into training for women in business skills, more finance going to women, and also a, a real, a, a, an understanding that there is a gender impact in this. Sometimes uh, schemes for business owners that are geared mainly to men don't necessarily speak to or, or provide the right help to women. And finally, of course, we can help each other. Uh, role models, uh, mentoring, networking, you know, for years and years and years there have been these old boy networks. We need to do more. And rather than say old girl networks, I'd like to say we need to have more sisterpreneurs. Yes, I do love Sisters that. Sisters who are entrepreneurs you. together. Yes, exactly. And I want to come back to the idea of entrepreneurship. But before that, you said something just now. You said you can't leave it to chance. We've left it to chance for far too long. So what could a women-focused recovery plan look like, whether it's businesses that need to do that or, you know, the ILO is calling on governments to create a women-focused recovery plan? What should that look like to really make a difference? What are some of the practical steps a business can take? Well, before, before I move to that, let me just say it does make sense, you know, because all the reports show that if we can bring more women into the economy, the impact that makes on global growth and development is massive. So really, we must use these precious resources. And of course, there are different things to do. So business, well, first of all, of course, what we see now is that flexible working actually does work. And it's not just a mummy track or a second best. Actually, in many ways, it's, it can be more productive um, and it can um, produce better quality work, leaving out the tyranny, if you like, of commuting. So I think we will see men and women 
wanting to work more flexibly. That's not to say I'm not someone who says uh, that there isn't a lot of benefit from face-to-face -face contact with your peers, with your managers. Of course there is. But I think we will see more flexible working, and that's something that businesses can encourage at the same time as ensuring that not in the office is not valued, because there is a, there is a danger uh, for that. After all, I think we all know that once upon a time there was a lot of presenteeism in what was going on in offices, just being seen yes. to be there. And that wasn't just by chance. That was because seeing is believing, if you like. So I think employers need to look at their systems and work out how they make sure um, that they value workers when they're working from home as well as when they're working in the office and how they give opportunities for people to develop within that uh, concept, uh, context rather. I, I think in, then in relation to governments, there's so much more we can, we can do there. For example, haven't we seen through this crisis how important care is? Yes. Whether it's care for the elderly, care for our children, uh, care for the disabled and vulnerable, and yet how often is care work undervalued and certainly low paid? Um, and, you know, often it's governments themselves that are responsible for the wages of some of the yeah. people in the care sector. You know, generally speaking, certainly in the UK, for example, it's our governments who value the, the, the cleaners and the nurses less than other um, other professions in, in medicine. So we need to look at how we, how we uh, do, do that. I think we also need to look much more at the availability of high quality care work, high quality care for the elderly and high quality childcare. Again, it's been Cinderella services. Governments need to do more because what we've realized is our economy doesn't go. Our economy doesn't really drive without these women feeling secure that the people they care about, their children, their relatives, are being properly cared for. If they're not being properly cared for, what tends to happen is it tends to be the women that drop out in order to do that as well. So that there are lots of social policies that the government could do. Minimum wages, obviously, is, 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 is something as well. But skills training. Skills training is so important. Um, and I think within that skills training, as I said already, we ought, ought to look at actually how to run a business training, entrepreneurship training, encouraging people to take the plunge. And there are many ways you can do that through grants and also through the, uh, the tax and benefit system to make that happen. Because we have to get the country back to work again. And we know now, don't we, that there are going to be so many um, closed businesses that are Mm -hmm. They're not going to, to be resurrected, and maybe they'll never be resurrected in the same form again, and therefore we need to find other ways to engage people in the economy. And by the way, I think there's more we can do as individuals too, um, whether it's um, the way we relate to our fellow workers, whether, as I said before, the, the way we step forward as, as role models and mentors, the way we sponsor and encourage other women, and the way we also choose where we buy and who we buy from on the basis of the values of those businesses. And, um, you know, to some extent, one can see that if we're, if we're buying very, very cheap clothing, for example, which is disposable and thrown away, we have to ask ourselves, really, on whose backs was this made? Yeah. Was this made? And we, we see that particularly Bangladesh, as you know, the country I know uh, quite a lot about because I'm Chancellor of the Asian University for Women. Yeah. You know, the, the, the garment workers in that sector, you know, we saw big name companies just cancel their contracts, driving their suppliers out of business and the suppliers' employees out of jobs. You know, we mm -hmm. cannot see that behavior replicated. I want to go back to one point you made, which is affordable care. 
And when I was prepping a little bit more for this interview, I was, you know, going through some uh, some mummy chats on the internet and seeing what the buzz was about, what people were talking about. And this is one thing that came up over and over again, the need for affordable care, whether it's affordable child care or affordable care for extended family members. I would love to know a little bit more about how you think this can be achieved. How do we create a safety net or an environment where women aren't the only caretakers, so to speak, you know, how can they have more support? Do companies need to step in and make this available? Some companies do, but what are your thoughts and how do we achieve this? Well, I think that, yes, some companies do, but I think, you know, there's only so much that companies can do. I mean, you know, one hears about nurseries in the workplace, which can be a good thing sometimes. But then on the other hand, if children are going to school in their neighborhoods, it's not necessarily a solution to bring them in into the to the city for for nursery so we need to do more about making affordable care available where where it's actually needed which is probably in the local community um rather than bussing people around to that care to do that of course one needs government support but we also need i think a change in the um attitude of society What's very interesting, I mentioned my foundation. When I went to India a couple of years ago to see some of the women we were supporting um, with our mentoring uh, program there in Delhi, one of the businesses um, I went to see was a woman who was providing daycare for the elderly in Delhi itself. And that's Mm. relatively um, new thing because traditionally, of course, Asian families, Indian families, you know, the, the care is provided by the daughter-in-law. But That's right, in, we don't outsource it. Yeah. No, but, you know, in, in as uh, the middle class has developed in India and as, as women are more educated, of course, particularly in the big cities, uh, there are people who've moved away from their families to work. Mm-hmm. There are elderly people who, who have also moved away from their families to work and now find themselves living in a place where their families uh, no longer are. And and for these people, there is a need and a demand for daycare and indeed possibly uh, also residential care. But there's a societal change that has to happen to, to for people to understand that this is not necessarily a second best option. This is a and that uh, to understand that the need for people living on their own to come together and to socialise. Uh, uh, is, is, is an important part of their mental and physical health. So there is also a societal change of mind uh, that, that, needs, that needs to happen. Uh, so I think that is, is equally important. And then it's, it, it's again about supporting the people who are going to do these, these jobs. So uh, whether, you know, we, a lot of women, I think, could set up their own businesses doing that but you could also uh, support people coming together and doing it as a cooperative, you know, community nurseries, community um, places for the elderly. In fact, we've seen a lot of research where actually if you could allocate a nursery near where old people are also coming together, the two work so beautifully together, providing children with, with homes when we don't see their grandparents with older role models and providing elderly people who perhaps don't see their grandchildren so much with the pleasure that we all get, speaking as a grandmother, from having young uh, kids around. We just have to start reimagining the world in a way that reflects the reality of the 21st century and where we are now and not continue to pretend that what happened 50 years ago, even if it was the norm there and, and as someone whose mother had to go out to work 50 years ago because she was a single mother, uh, it wasn't always the case anyway that that wasn't, wasn't the case. But the fact is today, so many families need two incomes and we need to start planning our policies around the idea of what supports people to be the best they can be, both as parents, as the, the people supporting the next generation and the previous generation, and of course, as generators of wealth for the economy, because wealth for the economy means wealth for us all. 
That's right. And we need, as you say, we need new solutions for new challenges, right? Digitization has been a big story this year, the use of technology. What role can digitization play towards creating a more level playing field for men and women in the workforce? Well, I think what we've seen is that, you know, digitalization and, and the, the, the internet is a valuable tool in all this. I mean, we've already talked about what we're doing now. Um, right. My foundation, you know, when I set up my foundation in 2008, it was partly because I recognized I myself as a businesswoman, as a lawyer, had been able to continue my work because I'd used technology. And I mm. wanted to see whether that didn't have to just be about fortunate women living in, you know, the, the richest countries in the world. And actually there was an opportunity here to give access to learning, to support, uh, to uh, ideas, to women all over the world. And that is how we have um, operated ever since using technology to bring the tools to the women where they are and in the reality in which they find themselves. So, for example, we have a Her Venture app, which we use on our, it's available to download on your mobile phone. And we're doing that in uh, Indonesia, in Vietnam, in Mexico, in Nigeria, in Kenya. And uh, what we do there, I call it a nano MBA, and it's a series of like seven minute, six, seven minute bite sized learning about how to run a business, the challenges for business, how to get better at developing your products, your market. And we, during this pandemic, have told a, put a whole segment in about resilience and how to pivot to selling more online. And it's designed to be in bite-sized pieces so that if you're a woman running a, I don't know, a small hairdresser shop or a, uh, a clothing shop, you can do it between customers or you can do it while you're waiting to pick up your children. And it's all about the flexibility of learning when it, it suits you as opposed to having to come to a static learning. And I think we're going to see so much more of that uh, in the future. And that, that's a great thing because the other thing that happens is that technology enables you to get this information uh, in an accessible way, which perhaps you have not been able to do before. Uh, you know, once upon a time, you had to go to a static place to get learning yeah. and you were dependent on the knowledge of a particular teacher in a particular environment. Today, of course, we can make world-class knowledge available into the remotest areas, provided, of course, people have access uh, to technology. You know, and it's interesting, even someone like Pope Francis has declared that, uh, you know, about the, the, the human right of people to have access to the internet, because we still have yes. a situation, do we not, where the poorest people, and out of the poorest people, overwhelmingly, they are women too. I mean, when we look at all the research about yes. who gets access to technology, women take second place. So we need yes, to do more to make sure that they get enormous. equal access. The digital That's divide right. is enormous, and but the digital uh, div the digital potential is also enormous. So right. we need to do more. And again, it's something that companies and governments can do together to make the uh, internet accessible to all, because you need the infrastructure, you need the the legislative environment and you need the scale to make it uh, affordable. And we've just in Nigeria, as it happens, done um, with our app, we've uh, entered into an arrangement with Nine, which is one of the mobile phone operators there. And they are offering for free to, on, on their phones, access to our Her Venture app. Last time we tried that in Nigeria, when we had a, an earlier iteration of, of, of this sort of learning, which was all by text messages. We got 100,000 women in Nigeria uh, downloading the app and 20,000 men <laughs> who didn't mind that that, that <laughs> uh, thinks it, they saw also that it was, it was useful. And so the more we can spread this, this learning and this technology, the better. And technology really helps us take things to scale. 
Mrs. Blair, we have time for one more question, and there is an area I wanted to um, talk to you about, and that's domestic violence. And we have seen a huge spike in domestic violence since the lockdowns began. And, uh, you know, some men are victims too, but again, disproportionately, women have borne the brunt of that. And from what you've seen and uh, you've heard, you work with women around the world and you're a passionate advocate for gender equality. Tell us a little bit about what you've seen and what you've heard. And again, what are some of the learnings? What can we put in place to, to help? Well, I am at, I happen to be a patron of Refuge, for example, which is a big uh, domestic violence charity here in, 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 in the UK. And, you know, Refuge also um, uh, is the provider of the helpline for domestic violence in England and Wales. And as you say, there's no doubt requests for help have shot through the roof. And it's not surprising, isn't it? Because for so many women, the message stay at home doesn't mean stay in a safe place at all. It means stay, stay in a place where you're being abused and mm. with an abuser who is also staying at home. For many uh, women and their children who experience domestic violence, and of course the small proportion of men that do, at least being able to get out of the house is a respite. Meeting other people, it's also a form of escape. Suddenly, you're trapped in a smaller environment which is in, in already intense with your abuser. Uh, the second problem has been, of course, um, refuges have had to close their doors because obviously they are uh, communal places and they have to comply with the government guidelines uh, for that too. So there have been fewer places available for the women who have chosen uh, to escape. Um, so it's no doubt at all that COVID has made domestic abuse even harder. Um, but of course, you know, it's not just, um, well, there are many things we can do. One of the good things we are doing in the UK is we've got a new domestic abuse bill, by the way, which not only um, provides more resources for refuges and, and, and helplines for domestic violence, but it also recognises that abuse doesn't have to just be physical. There is psychological, mental, and indeed even economic abuse. Um, and that is sometimes not understood as being a core part of domestic abuse. And it's a positive step and a way that you can see how governments and the law can help. And the, the good thing about our domestic abuse bill is that it was pushed forward, not just by the government and politicians, but by a coalition of workers and organizations in this field coming together, speaking out and working together to devise a bill which hopefully will provide the resources needed. But of course, the bottom line is uh, you need resources. And uh, yes. that is always the, the problem when we've got, well, we're going to have an economic crisis on our hands. Mm. Absolutely. As you say, we need resources and we need new solutions for new challenges. Mrs. Blair, thank you so much for your time today and sharing some of your ideas on this very important topic. We appreciate your time. I appreciate you asking me. Thank you so much. And if anyone wants to know more about the foundation, go to www.shreeblairfoundation.org. Join us in this campaign to ensure that women get their fair share of economic development. Hi there, my name is Simone Andrews and I'm an ESG analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence. Today, I'm gonna to be discussing the rising importance of social issues in the financial markets. I'm gonna be particularly talking about the impact of the pandemic on female workers and gender equality. I'm gonna give you a couple of data points to really talk about our evidence and just really get into the, the ways in which um, this pandemic is playing out. So before I get into the discussion, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of Bloomberg Intelligence. We provide um, research analysis on companies, industries, and global markets. We cover 135 industries. We also cover 2,000 companies. I sit on the BI ESG team, and there we look at environmental, social, and governance risk that are material to the financial markets. So we look at this at a company, industry, and thematic um, perspective. 
And you can find all of our research on BI ESG Go. So today I wanna to just highlight a few points. One is that the pandemic is likely going to remain a top ESG issue well into 2021, even with the vaccine. Second point I would like to make is just that the, the virus related shutdowns have disproportionately impacted women compared to men in the EU and the US. And really, really when you pull back the hood, you start to see a, a joblessness that's uneven. And it's uneven across different countries within the EU and also across race within the US. And so what does this all mean? It means that long-term unemployment and the loss of skills may mean less economic growth. Um, and that has a, you know, that could potentially have a credit impact. So in this chart, I just wanted to highlight what we mean when we talk about social issues um, and, and from an ESG perspective. So here you have the, the, the G, a few of the G20 countries. And so a few of the metrics that we're keeping track of that um, are social indicators are the number of COVID cases, the unemployment rate, the Gini coefficient, which is an indicator of income inequality, demographics, issues and, and challenges, as well as um, labor participation. So that so these are all issues that you can kind of keep track of on on Bloomberg Terminal, and these are the issues that we have found to be most material. When we look at the pandemic as one of the 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 biggest social issues, it's not just a health issue; it's also the impact on jobs and on the economy. And so what we have here is that the Oxford University and the IMF has put out research showing that longer and more stringent um, lockdown measures had an impact on GDP forecast errors. So in short, that means that those longer and stringent um, shutdowns had an, uh, uh, a negative impact on, on GDP. And so that is um, one of the, the issues that we're keeping track of. So what does this all mean for, for women and, and, and women workers in Europe? And what is the, the, this thought of the new normal? So when we look at the unemployment rate, women workers have been hit hardest during the pandemic in Europe. So you can see here on this chart that the, the unemployment rate for women was 9%. And that compares to the unemployment for men, which was 8%. So one, I just want to highlight here that part of, part of the story is that um, women workers tend to be in, um, in industries that were hardest hit by the pandemic. So that whether that be the service industry, hospitality, tourism, those frontline jobs were disproportionately, excuse me, disproportionately held by women. The other thing that we also note is that um, women tend to um, really hold the um, really hold down childcare. So um, when the pandemic hit, um, women had to take on more of that role, whether it's childcare or just caregiving in general. When we start to look at the joblessness rate across Europe, you'll see um, different patterns of unemployment. So in Spain and Italy, you see higher levels of unemployment for, for, for women as compared to the UK, um, Germany, um, and, and France. So uh, part, of, part of the story in Spain is that um, um, the or women were temporarily 47% of women were either employed temporarily or on a part-time basis. So again, once that once the pandemic hit, um, those types of labor dynamics um, were really exacerbated. And the story doesn't just stop with the unemployment numbers. For women who are, you know, still employed, you know, we could start to see pay, the pay gap widen, particularly in a place like UK, France, Germany. So you can see here that the UK and, and Germany already have a, uh, a wide pay gap between men and women of 20%. And so these types of dynamics can also play out and have an impact on, 
on advancement and, and, and career progression. So now let's turn, let's take a look at the U.S. and see what um, what the new normal is in terms of uh, uh, gender equality. So for the first time the, in the U.S., female workers uh, were more uh, had a higher unemployment rate than men during the recession. So if you look back the past 30 years, you'll see that uh, for the most part, m men tend tended to be um, hit hard during a recession. But in this pandemic-related recession, women have an unemployment rate of 16% um, as compared to, to men, which is over 13%. And so you start to see, again, that the, the, you know, the types of jobs that women are in um, really start to impact their, 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 jobless, their job rate. If we now look at the, the unemployment numbers by race, you start to see another story that uh, women of color were disproportionately impacted compared to, um, to white female workers. And this again, you know, is to the point of the, the different types of employments that were, were, were hit um, in the pandemic. Now, if we take a step back and we look at labor participation in the U.S., you know, it's just, it's just an interesting point that the U.S. is uh, trails behind its European uh, peers. So if you look at Sweden, Norway, the U.K., um, they all have higher rates of female participation in the labor, labor force than in the U.S. So what does this all mean? So I've given you the unemployment numbers. I've given you the labor participation numbers and the, and the pay gap um, numbers. And so if if the lockdowns and the shutdowns continue, which they may well into 2020, 2021 continue, then the the advancements for um, for women in terms of pay and career progression may start to slow it um, slow down. And so, unless there is really a policy response in the EU and in the U.S. that's targeted towards women, we met those types those gender um, those gender inequalities may be may be widened. So thank you and, and thank you for the opportunity to be a part of the conversation. Thanks, Simone. Hello and welcome everyone to the next part of this event. Joining us today, we have four powerful speakers from the world of gender equality. So let me introduce them. We've got first, we've got Lisa King. She's the Director of External Communications at Refuge. Welcome, Lisa. Hi there. Next we have Next, we have Shauna Orney. She's the chief of the Gender Equality and Diversity Branch at the International Labour Organization, the ILO. Welcome, Shauna. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Next, we have Felicia Willow, chief executive of the Fawcett Society. Hi, Felicia. Hello. Great to be here. And finally, we have Dr. Halima Begum, director of the Running Me Trust. Hi, Halima. Thanks for having us. Okay, let's get started. The pandemic has led to a huge change in the labor market, causing women to lose out exponentially, both economically and socially. Today, we will look at the impact of the co of COVID-19 and how it has caused mass unemployment among women. In addition, we have seen a rise in domestic violence during the lockdown. We will address some serious issues concerning women and what the long-term effects could be, which leads me to my first question. Shauna, let's have a look at this internationally. What changed for women during the pandemic? Why are women particularly vulnerable? Thank you. The ILO has been monitoring the employment situation across the globe during the pandemic. And we found that most our most recent estimate is that 500 million full-time equivalent jobs have been lost. So in terms of working hours, it, it comes to 500 uh, full-time jobs. And women have been hit the hardest in that. So they're losing their jobs at a faster pace than men are or the working hours. If we look at the sectors that have been hardest hit by the pandemic, those are the sectors where women predominate. So 
women are in the services, they're in accommodation, they're in real estate, they're in areas that where we've seen the biggest decline. So they're getting hit from that perspective. On the other side, they're also heavily dominating the frontline workers. So they're, they're hit twice. They're hit in the sectors where the jobs are being lost. They're hit in the sectors where they are most at risk in terms of their health. So they're the frontline workers, they're the care workers, so all the care workers are women, and they're getting hit on that front. Then a third angle where they're also getting hit disproportionately is in terms of unpaid care. So we know that, uh, that schools have been closing down, and even though the kids are going back to school now, a lot of that is in remote or hybrid models. So decisions are being taken about who's going to give up their job, who's going to stay home with the kids to do all that work that needs to be done to make sure the kids can be accompanied through their education because they're not getting that direct support at school. And the majority of those are women who are, who are taking on those roles. So women's employment prospects are very much defined uh, by their domestic responsibilities in a way that men's aren't. So I think that's one of the big issues that's really impacted on women. Thank you. All right, um, let's zoom in a little bit and look at the UK. Um, Felicia, you're here representing the Fawcett Society, one of the UK's biggest women charities. Let's look more specifically at the UK. Um, what spe specific circumstances have, the, have women faced there? Was the, has the government done enough to make sure women um, can survive this crisis? I think what we're seeing uh, in the UK is the same kind of issues that we've just heard about internationally. Um, the lockdowns have had different impacts on women throughout the period. So I think the first lockdown, um, as has just been said, had a huge impact on mothers. And we saw that uh, mothers were doing two hours less paid care, uh, paid work, sorry, a day and two hours more childcare. Um, we saw the time obviously going up for fathers too, but not at the same proportion. So mothers were taking on a disproportionate amount of that burden and that obviously affected their, their prospects at work. Um, we also found that um, mothers were one and a half times more likely to have lost their jobs during the first lockdown. Um, and all of these things that are also in the way of women generally, the kind of the barriers, the pay and progress issues, the biases, obviously they're all still there and they're being really inflated by COVID and what's going on. Um, I think the uh, the second lockdown has been slightly different for some uh, mothers, of course. We've got children back at school, but of course there's still been a number of schools shut down, classes being sent home, and there's that constant stress about whether or not uh, work is going to be able to continue as normal or whether you're going to have a number of children at home again. So that's continuing to be a pressure on many, uh, many mothers. Um, but we're also seeing, as has just been said, that the, uh, the second lockdown really was around different sectors and there was a real gendered impact on that. So women tending to predominate in hospitality and in retail, those sectors were shut down, um, whereas manufacturing and construction where men tend to be more populous uh, were still open. So we're seeing um, ONS released some statistics just today that showed that women are um, more furloughed in the last week of November than men are. And so we're expecting that this is going to continue on because more the more higher likelihood of furlough obviously can lead to redundancies as well. So this is obviously all um, significantly concerning. And I think another factor that's really important to recognise is the, the anxiety levels. Of course, you know, we're seeing anxiety levels go up across everybody. It's not just women who are being affected. But um, again, looking at some um, between men and women, women are having a disproportionate impact of the worry and the anxiety that comes from um, from the COVID impact. And so what we're seeing is women are less comfortable going out of the home, feel less comfortable with that kind of thing, but they're picking up the, the greater majority of responsibilities to do the shopping, to pick up medicine, to take children to school. Um, all of those kind of things are still falling heavily on women. So I think there's a lot of things going on there that really need to be taken into account about women in the workforce and making sure that when decisions are being made, they're not having this disproportionate impact that we're already seeing. Um, just following up on that, um, how much do you think would this be reflected in the gender pay gap? I mean, the gender pay gap is something that is is significantly important. You know, we feel really strongly that um, organisations should be reporting on the gender pay gap. Um, it's uh, it's something that hasn't been hugely successful voluntarily. We would like to see um, all employers of more than 100 staff 
uh, legally required to report on the gender pay gap, but also to take an, an action plan um, that they have to enforce. We're, we're not seeing a lot of action being done even in those organisations that have been doing a gender pay gap reporting. So it is a massive problem. And I think this is the thing. We have very real barriers in place already um, against women in the workforce and COVID is, is pushing us even further back. Um, and that's really got to be something that um, businesses and obviously the government have to be aware of. You know, we'd like to see the government uh, really grappling more with um, these issues and how these things are affecting women so disproportionately. And so far, we haven't really seen that enough um, to date. Okay, thanks. Um, Halima, um, looking at the socioeconomic factors, um, Black and Asian communities um, seem particularly vulnerable here. And why is it that race is still such a determining factor for health and socioeconomic status in Britain? Thanks. Yeah, so when we, when we talk about women who are disproportionately impacted by either economic recession or COVID, we have to look at which groups of women we mean. We are essentially talking about poorer women. We're essentially talking about black and minority ethnic groups who tend to be poorer, who therefore will be disproportionately impacted. So it's really important that when we discuss a group, we actually slice down and disaggregate who it is that we're talking about. And we have a real challenge in the UK in disaggregating who it is that we're referring to, even when we have disaggregated data to tell us that these are women or these are BME groups. Um, our own research with the Women's Budget Group has shown that BME women were actually amongst the most worst impacted in the last 10 years by public service cuts. And I don't mean just BME groups, I mean BME women. So BME women are even worse off than BME groups in general. So we often talk about the double whammy that BME women face, both as women, because they suffer sexism in the workplace, but also as black and Asian minorities who suffer racism in the workplace. And the reason why um, there are barriers in place and there's a lack of progression for BME women and also poorer white women is, is because of sexism, because of classism, and also because of racism. And I think in 2020, when we've all seen the kind of murder of George Floyd over the summer in the US. It's really important that we actually have an honest conversation about what it is that we're discussing and not kind of shy away from actually the race lens that we need to discuss. Racism is very real. So we often find in our research that BME women, even when you account for qualifications, they don't get the same jobs. Even when they've got better degrees, they don't get promoted. Even when they're performing better, they get stuck. So it is really important to look at that whole layer of equality within the workforce to figure out why it is that that progression isn't taking place. Larger numbers of BME women are also unemployed. So remember, women at work is one part of the picture, but larger numbers of BME groups remain unemployed and women within that. So it's really important that we look at that number as well and what it is that we can do to support these women. We were very concerned about the kind of precarious financial uh, circumstances of BME groups and women long before COVID. And I can tell you right now that when you look at the statistics around the economic situation of different groups in the UK, these would all show you the figures pre-COVID. What we know now, looking at the data from the Resolution Foundation, is that black and minority ethnic households post-COVID have almost certainly a third of those households will have lost a wage earner and they would be lucky to be on furlough. Those that got furlough were the lucky ones. Although that's not lucky, we understand, because that might actually pose risk of redundancies. But many of our uh, demographics often work in the gig economy, precarious economy and so on. So we, we remain really, really concerned that when we discuss how it is that we build back differently, and you'll hear me say differently, not better, because we actually want to redesign in a more inclusive way, we do think about um, designing up from those who are most at risk are who are most vulnerable. And these will be elderly groups. These will be women uh, who are having to stay at home because of a lack of childcare and so on. And these will be BME women as well. Okay. Um, moving on to you, Lisa. Um, we've seen some horrific numbers regarding domestic violence during lockdown. How bad has it actually been? And have you seen any difference between the first and the second lockdown in the UK? Yes, thank you. Um, certainly, lockdown has been a very concerning time for women who experience domestic abuse. And just to set the scene a bit, uh, irrespective of COVID, domestic abuse is the biggest social issue affecting women and children. So it's a huge, huge matter. 
pre-COVID, those figures are staggering, with one in four women experiencing domestic abuse at some time in her life, and two women being killed every week in England and Wales alone, and that's week in, week out, decade in, decade out. But that's actually pre-COVID. What we saw in COVID times, especially during lockdown periods, and certainly first lockdown, where we've been able to really look at those figures, was a massive surge in calls and contacts to the National Domestic Abuse Helpline that Refuge runs, to our um, website for information and contact. And during lockdown, we launched a live chat service, knowing that women couldn't call us, um, being very limited with opportunities to pick up the phone and speak. So we created some digital tools to ensure kind of real-time, live, immediate contact. Um, the figures that we saw were, were frightening in terms of, you know, demand increasing, especially at certain times during that, say, summer period. Um, we've had a lot of contact to our live chat channels and our websites. And statistics released by other organisations counting dead women cited a double of the homicides in those first few weeks of, of lockdown. So a huge, huge issue for women um, being trapped with their perpetrators, being isolated uh, with those who had uh, perpetrated domestic abuse pre-COVID. And COVID has exacerbated that violence and that abuse and the many different forms that it takes. And looking at it through kind of an employment COVID workplace lens um, makes us think more specifically about economic abuse as a form of domestic violence. And economic abuse has certainly increased during COVID. We did a piece of research earlier in the year and then a second wave um, two months ago to look at it through a COVID lens. And a lot of economic abuse started during the COVID period for women due to unemployment, due to being furloughed, loss of income. So really, really concerning that those aspects of COVID have exacerbated domestic abuse. So we are certainly concerned for women um, in this country at the moment and hope very much that you know, they are made aware that services exist so that they can turn to us and, and know they're not alone and reach out and get support. It's quite shocking. Um... Um, so, um, Shauna, um, I know that the um, ILO has actually um, campaigned quite a lot on um, violence and harassment. And um, last year, you introduced the Violent and Harassment Convention. To um, What um, specific um, incidents have you seen during the pandemic internationally? And how does your convention um, try to um, help this? Thank you. Now, last year, in 20, June 2019, Convention 190 on Violence and Harassment in the World of Work was adopted, as you mentioned, and that was pre-COVID. But what's so interesting coming into COVID is we see that all the issues that are set out in Convention 190 are more relevant than ever. So it's been a real test of, of Convention 190. Now, if we look at the Convention, it recognizes the right of everyone to a world of work free from violence and harassment. So you know, a very broad right there that, uh, that's embedded in the, in the convention. Now, remember, the convention is a treaty, an international law, and the ILO being a little bit different than other UN uh, bodies, we're tripartite. So we, it's not just governments who are, who are negotiating and making these decisions. It's also representatives of workers and employers. So you have the actors of the real economy who are there. And um, so all those actors came together to negotiate this convention, as well as an accompanying rec recommendation that gives a bit more guidance. What's interesting about 190 is it, it recognizes that link between the world of work and domestic violence. And that was really innovative in the, in the convention, because often they're seen as very separate spheres. Now, COVID has seen how those spheres really aren't so separate and how, how incredibly linked they are. When a lot of people are working from home now, the home is their workplace, and there is not that divide between you know, my, my work life and my, my private life. But the convention already saw that there was that link, that not just when you're working at home, but the domestic violence also spills over into, into the workplace and has quite an impact there. So I think that, that piece has been quite important there. The convention requires that member states take an inclusive, integrated and gender responsive approach to address and prevent violence and harassment in the world of work. So it has to be very concrete. 
And it gives a framework for doing that, which again is, is really very relevant in the COVID con context. We have to look at the underlying causes and risk factors, stereotypes, multiple and intersecting discrimination, as we, as we heard before, um, unequal po gender power relationships are really important in terms of addressing those issues. And it also sent, sets out a, a framework for workplace measures. So um, you could have leave for victims, flexible work arrangements, um, including violence and harassment and domestic violence in your workplace risk assessment. There are a huge number of, of elements that are available within the convention and the recommendation to actually put together um, policy frameworks, legislation policy at the national level, as well as at, at the workplace level. So we're able to leverage, I think, this moment to really show how important um, Convention 190 is and move forward that ratification process. Thank you. Um, Sean, I know when we were speaking um, before um, this talk, you mentioned that, you, that you've also seen a lot of violence against frontline workers. That there, that and that this again is an area where women, or uh, where a lot more women are frontline work, uh, work in healthcare. Yes, no, absolutely. We've seen a, a spike in violence against healthcare workers, against certain nationalities as well, because of assumptions that that they may be infected, and um, and we, and that's of course also with with care workers. There's that violence because of the stress, the fear, um, the poor working conditions as well, the stigma that's come out. So this has been something that, that has been very problematic. And again, Convention 190 talks about different sectors and the fact that there are sectors where um, there are higher levels of violence and harassment and that special measures have to be taken there. Okay. Um uh, Felicia, um, you, um, we've already previously mentioned um, that um, we're in a recession and that we're likely to be in a recession for some time. Um, do you think, um, is there a worry that um, extra austerity measures will mean that women um, are hit even stronger going forward? What we've seen so far is that I think the the female perspective, that women's uh, interests have not really been at the forefront of the decisions that have been made so far. Um, I mean, an example of this is around childcare. You know, childcare has been a massive issue throughout the whole pandemic. I and mean, we were talking about things earlier on about uh, how that affected women in work, but actually it hasn't been a focus of the government. Um, and it continues to be it's teetering on a knife edge at the moment, even before COVID, uh, childcare, the childcare industry was in crisis. It, it wasn't getting enough money coming in. Um, and of course, COVID has just absolutely uh, destroyed that. So you're seeing a lot of um, childcare facilities being shut down. There's not the kind of uh, financial support to keep these things going. It hasn't been part of the rescue package that have come through. Um, so I think, you know, it, it really is important that women are involved in these decisions. You know, I think what we're seeing is these decisions are being made um, by a small group of men um, and we're not seeing them being made with, you know, really understanding how they're having a gendered impact um, when they actually come out into the real world. So, yes, I think there's real concerns about how those kind of things will affect uh, women going forward because we've seen how the last uh, nine months or so has um, has affected them so far and it's not encouraging. So do you, overall, do you think there should be more of an upgrade of the profession, maybe of the child carer and more money in this to make it a more attractive job so that there's, there's a, there are enough people to do this and to... Um, I, I, I'm, I myself don't have children, but I don't know with my colleagues who do have children how they manage to work working from home with kids. Kids need attention. You can't just do it on the side and it just feels like your days are getting longer and longer. And um, They absolutely yeah. are. Yeah, but I mean, I, I have two children myself <laughs> and, uh, and we were home for, for five months over lockdown and, you know, my husband and I split the work completely straight down the middle and we worked very, very long days to make that happen. Um, around childcare, you know, yeah, you look at things like the free hours, which has been a fantastic idea, but they're underfunded. So a lot of organisations that are running childcare can't actually afford to take them take those vouchers on. Um, so it, it's, it's something that's like, you know, a great idea, but just pay what it actually costs to run um, run these organisations. You know, it's uh, you know, it would be great to see um, childcare uh, providers being able to pay their staff more, because of course we see 95% of childcare 
staff are women again. So, you know, we've got all these double whammies of women being underpaid. And then, of course, when the, uh, you know, if the childcare sector fails as well, we're seeing women losing their jobs. And of course, then we see that then knock on effect to mothers who then have to take the lion's share of the childcare at home. So it's it's just a disaster all round if we don't have childcare. And I think that's something that really needs investment and, and support from the government and a real recognition that it's not... Um, it's it's not a kind of added extra. It's something that every everybody needs to have access to affordable, good quality um, childcare. Yeah, really important. <laughs> um, Halima, um, in that respect, um, austerity has hit, you already mentioned in your opening statement that austerity has been particularly bad on the Black and Asian community and on women. Um, you see this um, going forward as well, that we, given that what a deep recession we are in. Sorry, I think you're on mute, Halima. Yeah, so uh, one of my concerns is that we will see some groups recovering from the recession faster and we'll see those that are recovering in a slower pace. And we need to look at who the slower groups will be. BME groups for sure, migrant groups living in the UK, people who are vulnerable or at risk, I would say. And we need to think about what it is that we need to put in place to bring these groups forward, because ultimately these are the groups that actually work in the front line. They are public sector workers, they are BME groups. And if you look at government support and what has been made available, you only have to look back last week in the UK to look at the fact that um, our chancellor announced a public sector pay freeze on the assumption and the argument that that keeps us on parity with the private sector. Well, we know that the private sector wage historically was not on a level playing field anyway. To suggest, therefore, that the pay freeze was going to level us up was somewhat misleading. So we do need to recognise that actually the right thing to do is to ensure that we have what we need to live a decent life, regardless of, of our wages. So I think we need to look at additional support. The other thing we really, really desperately need is... um. Support and finance is going to local authorities at a provincial level or a local authority level. What you've seen in this country, in the UK, is the handling of the pandemic that's been very nationally driven with a macroeconomic policy that assumes that if you manage and control from the centre, track and trace, for example, which was a huge waste of resources, that was going to help us out of the pandemic. We know that hasn't happened. If you look at Germany, if you look at South Korea, you know that the resources went straight to the localities where the vulnerability is most hit hardest. So we really are asking the government to channel down more resources so that BME groups, vulnerable groups, people at risk can recover quickly. Without that resource transfer, you will not get vulnerable and BME groups recovering as fast as the rest of the population. And it's all and in all our interest to see the whole country recover. Um, regarding um, austerity, um, how far are you um, concerned, Lisa, that potentially um, these um, cutback measures will also hit charities like your own? Yeah, I mean, very concerning. The austerity measures have been, you know, long-standing, 10 years, as, as, as has been mentioned. Also, so, you know, there has been a an obliteration of domestic abuse services at a ground level. And certainly, very sadly, for black minority ethnic women, those services have been particularly badly hit. There is a desperate need for those to be invested in and, um, and supported uh, and re-established, frankly. And yeah, we're very concerned about what the future holds with austerity measures deepening yet further. And I would support entirely the recommendation that funding needs to be channeled down to the local authorities, they need the money because they are given the task to support their local communities and they need to have that with immediacy. What we've seen from the government as a response to date during COVID has been pockets of money, but they've been, you know, piecemeal. They've had deadlines attached to them where it has to be spent by, you know, certain dates. And that hasn't allowed for planning or any kind of reassurance that frontline specialist services can run. And it is absolutely critical that that money does get down to the local authorities. We've been pushing and campaigning for the domestic abuse bill to um, become legislation for, I mean, five years, and it's kind of in and out, and it's due back to the House of Lords. Well, we had hoped by the end of the year, but there's no sign of that. So let's hope for the beginning of 2021. And within that, there is a, a there is, you know, a desire and a push from organisations like Refuge and others to have funding ring-fenced and devolved down to local authorities to rebuild our sector. 
because as we move through COVID, we can only expect demand to increase yet further and to support you know, some very vulnerable groups. These services are literally life-saving and desperately needed. Um, how, how concerned are you overall that because the, all the focus is on uh, um, COVID or on the economy, that um, domestic abuse overall is, some, is an area that will be neglected even more? Yeah, I mean, domestic abuse is, is by and large, you know, not a not a top priority, um, along with many other, you know, sections of society, mental health services and others. And that's a great, you know, tra travesty of our of our um, political climate. I mean, we are told that it's a priority area, but really until the funding comes through and we see that actually translate into real money and real services and commitment for those services um, to sustain them, but also rebuild those that have been lost and the tragedy that you know, is a, 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 an obliterated sector, you know, we will remain very concerned, you know, here on in, and, and we have to continue to appeal to the public to fund us. And, and that is not an appropriate kind of way to run an organisation and life-saving services. That's a good point. Um, we now got a question from the audience. Um, um, the, the question is, as women, what are the three things that we need to do now to ensure that the gender gap is less of an issue in the next generation? Um, I'll start with you, Shauna. Thank you. I think we, I mean, some of the issues have come up and uh, the key issue is around childcare. Uh, and that is not getting any better. But if we, if we don't deal with the care crisis, if we don't deal with that piece of it. It doesn't matter how much we mentor women or we provide them with subsidies or we do all kinds of other things. If we don't deal with that, we're not going to get women into, into jobs and into the good jobs. So I think that's a really key issue. Um, it's also important that we invest in high quality care jobs. And somebody else had already, had already mentioned that. There is a direct correlation, and, and we've done this research, between good working conditions in health, education, and social work, and better quality care. So if you want your kids to be well looked after, if you want your aging parents to be well looked after, we have to invest in good quality jobs. So, and those should be publicly funded. And then, so that's the care piece. On, on the other side, I think we also need to ensure there are more women in leadership. Now, somebody else had said, you know, we don't have enough women um, making decisions about the COVID response. They're not involved in that. And in fact, it, the best case scenario, there are about 25% of women on these COVID task, for, task forces nationally. And that's probably a high estimate. Um, we see globally that there are only 28% of managers and leaders who are women. And that figure hasn't changed in almost 30 years. So we've got to do something to really get women into those leadership positions and to have a voice in these decisions. And just my last one, and I'll be very quick, we need to push for ratification of Convention 190 across the globe. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Felicia, I know your organization has done a lot of campaigning on women in leadership roles. But are, is that one of your three um, things. Absolutely, <laughs> yes, um, and that that works both in the government and also in em employers. You know, big companies. Um, I think you know we're really keen to see more women standing for office at every level of government. We want to see women standing locally and uh, you know the county level and nationally. And we've been doing a lot of work to encourage people to encourage those they know to stand as well. Um, you know, this isn't a, a a partisan political thing. This is every party you know there's a lot of women working across all parts of the um all parties in, in the country to, to increase the number of women and we really support that kind of work we need more women in the room making the decisions from a political level absolutely and i think also um when we're looking at employers as well we need women to be in leadership positions we need them on the boards we need them in the rooms where these things are being made um being discussed so when we talk about covid if an employer is discussing redundancies or furlough or how we're going to get people back to work um 
and what that's going to look like, we need to make sure women are in the room. Um, and and I think, you know, we see that companies that have women at the highest levels perform better. It's it's proven. Um, so, you know, I think that if, if companies are wondering what they can do, that's the first thing. Have a bit of navel gazing and see where your women actually are, because we need those the people in the room making those decisions. Um, and I would say, you know, that that's uh, obviously diverse voices generally are really important. So it's not just men and women. We need to be making sure we're getting lots of different um, voices in those rooms to make sure that we're considering the different perspectives. Um, Childcare has already been mentioned. And as I've said, you know, that that is something I think that is absolutely essential. It's it's um, It's been really disappointing, I think, over the past this year to see how when this happened and everybody ended up at home, how we went back about 25 years in gender equality. Um, you know, I, I was shocked to see it amongst those I just knew. It was inevitably um, the mothers I was seeing who were picking up the slack and the fathers were shutting themselves in offices. And I, I couldn't quite understand it. And these, you know, these are the privileged kind of people who can actually work from home. And we were seeing that kind of thing. We also see, uh, you know, frontline workers, key workers who have to work outside the home, still picking up the majority of the uh, of the responsibilities when they're mothers. So, you know, it, childcare is an absolutely massive and central issue. Um, so I think that's that's probably three points, isn't it? The uh, leadership in politics, leadership in companies, and and also childcare. I could probably go on, but I'll stop at three. <laughs> All right. Um, Halima, what would you like? Would you worth three um, points, please? I, I'm just going to just throw in the point about representation. Obviously, look at BME women as well, because um, if you look at COVID, for example, if we know that black and minority groups have been disproportionately impacted, you want to make sure they're at the top table and, and that they are women as well. But my three recommendations would be, um, actually, Felicia, going back to something that your organisation campaigns for, closing the gender gap as well as the ethnicity pay gap. Now, we know that it's going to, you know, at this current rate, if you didn't do something amazing and interventionist, it would take 60 years to close the gender pay gap in the workplace. So do something, follow up with action. But I would even go further and say, disclose pay, pay uh, grades across all grades, because it's actually, if you remember the um, Sarah Ahmed case with the BBC, see, it's not illegal. I mean, it's against the law to actually pay people differently based on gender or actually or ethnicity. But then nevertheless, we know it still happens. So it's not the case that we are going out to recruit people uh, in grades in an illegal manner. What happens is that because the ethnicity or the gender pay gap is not disclosed, differences and dic discrepancies can emerge. So there needs to be a change in the law to make it possible to disclose wages so that employers are then pushed into doing the right thing. So something about the gender pay gap. Um, I'd also support the call for care, but maybe pushing that along the Scandinavian model and not thinking of that as something that belongs to mothers, but all carers and fathers as well. Because there's one thing we do know is that care shouldn't be feminised and we should think about care along the kind of gender lines as well. Um, and the other thing I would add is we are emerging out of COVID and a financial recession. If you look at how we emerge from crisis in general, you have to look at social safety nets below. We, what you can't do is just apply macroeconomic measures around boosting the economy. You have to look at supporting households to emerge out of poverty and austerity and the recession. So you do need to look at injecting funding maybe increasing universal credit or child benefit, because it's those families that can't come back. The economy might come back, but it will leave behind those groups that are disproportionately uh, affected. And so far, our chancellor has not thought about household level poverty and how you boost households to come out of this pandemic. And, and finally, Lisa, what would your three points be? Lisa? Sorry, did you ask me? I'm sure you did. Yes, sorry. Sorry. My yes. internet's gone a bit dodgy. Um, thank you. So uh, looking through the lens of refuge and domestic abuse, mine would be around what we call our three Ps. So prevention, provision and protection. I would be looking to have a lot more awareness raising, a lot more prevention of an understanding of domestic abuse. So many women are out there being controlled and coercively and otherwise and don't identify with the problem. So don't reach out and get help. So a massive awareness raising piece around prevention and um, protection. You know, we need the police to be there, understanding, supporting, picking up the phone, prioritising domestic abuse. It accounts for 25 percent of their time. Um, but the response is very poor. Um, Crown Prosecution Service, criminal justice also need to recognise, you know, that, that domestic abuse is serious crime and respond accordingly. 
And then coming back to my point, which is always going to be the way with refuge around provision. You know, we need services. We need money. We need to have a plethora of them. We need generic. We need culturally specific. We need to understand that domestic abuse affects all women, irrespective of age, race, um, you know, background, and to be there for all women. And I'm going to add in a final point, which is irritating, isn't it? But just to say housing, there's a massive need for housing in this country for um, people to be able to access affordable and uh, much needed because, you know, really, you can't begin a new life if you can't establish yourself and set up as, you know, a new beginning. Okay. I'd like to thank all four of you for joining us today. We're really grateful for your participation and perspective. Now I'm going to pass um, you back over to my colleague Malika Kapoor, who will close out this event. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of this program. Thank you for joining us and a big thank you to all our speakers for their time and their insight. Remember, we are active on social media, so please join the conversation there using the hashtag, hashtag Bloomberg Equality. Follow the conversation with at Bloomberg Live on LinkedIn, Twitter, or you can like us on Facebook. And to learn more about other upcoming events, please visit our website at BloombergLive.com. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Google Cloud, and everyone who joined us today. Don't forget, you can watch this on demand. Thank you for watching and stay well.